Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Audits and Risk Management Committee. Um, there's, it's Thursday, November 2nd. Um, let's start with roll call. Mr. Keeley? Here. Mr. Keeley? Good morning, Jasmine. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino? Present. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Whitaker? Here. Chairperson Bradford, you have a quorum. Thank and you so much. I have a brief statement to read, if I may. Thank you. The CalSTRS board meetings are live web streamed, video archived, and available to the public on calsters.com. Individuals who wish to address the board should wait for the 10 minute public comment period at the end of the agenda item that the speaker wishes to address. For comments not pertaining to a specific agenda item, there will be an opportunity for additional statements at the end of the open session. Each speaker is allowed a maximum of three minutes to comment. However, if there is not enough time for each speaker to have three minutes, the timing will be at the discretion of the chair. To protect the privacy of speakers under the age of 18 who wish to address the board, only their first name and affiliated organization may be provided, but other personal identifying information such as their last name, age, or school may not be shared. Thank you. Okay, first um, we have to approve our agenda without objection. We'll approve our agenda. Right. Any objections? Okay, our agenda is approved. Um, number two is consent agenda for items number two and three. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. And then we have, we're all the way down to number four already. <laughs> Um, there's an information item, and this is our progress report, and that's just information that I assume everybody read. <laughs> so we're just going to continue on. Um, I guess I need to stop for public comments. Are there any public comments so far? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to number five which will be Mr. Smith, Ms. Arias, and Mr. O'Malley. Yeah, so item five. Um, will be 5A and 5B will be presented together by Crow. Um, this is an action item, and they'll be presenting on the audit results for the basic financial statements and other pension information for the year ended June 30, 2023. So management is responsible for preparing these reports, so you will see these, um, hear about these reports at the full board later today. Um, Crow is here, and they, are basically expressing an opinion as to whether these reports are fairly stated in all material respects. So as you mentioned, we have Kevin Smith, Jen Aris, and um, Dan O'Malley. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I always like stealing the thunder from later on in the presentation. It was an absolutely great audit. Um, Probably the closest to a normal from a structural standpoint that we have performed post-COVID um, from being on site. I um, want to thank management. Audits are never easy. Co um, coordinating that with a hybrid work schedule of staff, et cetera. They were ultra responsive to us throughout the process, and it's why we're here in November being able to speak to the results. Today we will quickly go through the engagement team as well as the presenters. We'll focus upon the financial statement audit, the results of that audit, as well as discuss the other pension information. And again, as a reminder, that relates to the GASB 67 and 68. And it really provides your contributing entities the mechanism to allocate or to record their portion of the net pension liability upon their financial statements. And probably the most important part of our presentation is being able to answer any questions that you guys might have related to the conduct of the audit. So with you today, myself, I serve as the signing partner um, on the engagement. Uh, with me is Jen Aris, the second partner on the engagement, and Dan O'Malley, who's a senior manager. We need to get him a new picture. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, Dan is our primary senior manager on the engagement. Uh, deeply specialized within the kind of the future of audit and innovation, uh, as well as overall investment risk. So Dan is a critical asset, critical team member um, of the CalSTRS engagement. So when we think about the basic financial statements and, and what, we are, what we are engaged to provide you, one is the independent auditor's report. Again, that's on whether or not the financial statements are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. 
the required communication to those charged with governance, which is this presentation. And then as a byproduct of the engagement, we would report any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control that we might have identified. So a couple key points. Um, the independent auditor's report really spells out, and we'll go through some of these items, management's responsibility for the fair presentation of the financial statements, our responsibility to conduct our audit in accordance with both generally accepted auditing standards promulgated by the AICPA as well as government auditing standards. We have issued an unmodified opinion upon the financial statements, which is the highest level of assurance that we can provide. And it really means two things. One, the financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAAP, and they're supported by the underlying books and records of the system. We've included two emphasis of matters, um, paragraphs which are consistent with previous years. An emphasis of matter paragraph has no impact upon our opinion, but it really just alerts the reader to something that is important enough that we believe it deserves the attention of the reader of the financial statements. As part of this communication, we talk about the auditor's responsibilities under both those items. We are going to confirm to you that our planned scope and timing of the engagement was consistent with what we provided to you in our, in our planning kickoff session with the ARM committee. Our judgments related to the qualitative aspects and significant accounting practices we believe are consistent with previous years, are in accordance with accounting principles, and are really appropriate for an organization such as CalSTRS. We'll also talk about corrected and uncorrected misstatements, which can be identified um, through the audit process and any other communications that were required. The final deliverable is the independent auditor's report over internal control. Uh, we don't express an opinion upon internal controls. So unlike a PCOB or a Sarbanes-Oxley, we're not expressing an opinion upon the internal controls. But in order to plan our audit as well as perform our audit, we do test significant or key controls. And any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies would be required to report to you through this mechanism. So as I said, stole the thunder earlier, we have issued an unmodified opinion. Um, it is the highest level of assurance. You guys expect it, have grown accustomed to it. But again, it's the focal point and, and management should be um, commended for, for, um, for that. Our first emphasis of matter is really related to the key or the net pension liability that is not included within your financial statements but are a key disclosure of your financial statements. That's the amount that ultimately gets allocated out to your contributing entities. It is very much built upon actuarial assumptions and can have a significant impact upon whether or not those assumptions change. It is a significant key component of our audit. We test both the inputs. We, we, taught, we go to over 100 different contributing entities, test demographic data as well as salary information, and we also spend a significant amount of time understanding the actuarial assumptions and whether or not they're reasonable to arrive at the best estimate of the NP, NPL. I'll let Dan speak to our second emphasis of matter. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, so our second emphasis of a matter is related to the fair value of investments. Um, the, por the portfolio contains approximately $139 billion in alternative investments, which are valued based on um, estimates and, and information provided by the general partners and investment managers. Um, these investments do not have a readily determinable market value, um, and if a market did exist, there might be material differences between the, the valuation of these items. So us as auditors, we performed a lot of procedures looking at those estimates, making sure that they were reasonable assumptions, um, supporting the fair value. Um, however, however, if a market had existed, there could be differences. Um, the next section of our report talks about uh, management's responsibility. So management is responsible for the uh, preparation and fair presentation of the, the financial statements in accordance with US GAAP. They are also responsible for designing and maintaining, um, implementing and maintaining an internal control environment to, uh, in, to help ensure that the preparation and presentation of the financial statements are free of material misstatements, um, whether due to fraud or error. 
They're also responsible for evaluating any conditions or events that might uh, impact the entity's ability to, or might have sig placed significant doubt over the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Um, our responsibilities as it relates to the financial statements is to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error. Um, reasonable assurance is not absolute assurance. Um, so there is a, a potential that there could be material misstatements that were not detected by procedures, even though we're following the auditing standards, both laid out by generally accepted accounting standards or generally accepted auditing standards, as well as the government auditing standards. In performing our uh, audit in, in accordance with uh, the, the two applicable auditing standards, we exercise professional judgment um, and, and maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit. Um, we identify and assess risks of material misstatement and develop procedures to address and respond to those risks. Um, we obtain an understanding of internal control, it, both to help with our risk assessment as well as design our audit procedures. Um, but we are not performing uh, tests to, de to determine the effectiveness, and we do not express an opinion on the effectiveness of internal controls. We also evaluate the, the appropriateness of the accounting policies used, as well as the reasonableness of, of any significant estimates that management um, performs it, uh, in preparing their financial statements. And then we also conclude whether there are any uh, conditions or events that would raise uh, substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Um, so the second deliverable as, as a result of our audit is the, is the SAS 142 communications, so the, the required communications to those charged with governance. Those are lay out, laid out in a letter, and I'm just going to address, address the key points. Um, so within the letter, it will outline our responsibilities under the two applicable auditing standards. Um, we also planned our, uh, the, prior to beginning the audit, we discussed our audit plan and presented that at board. We did not delineate or um, we, we, we followed that audit plan as laid out um, to, the, to the board prior to beginning the audit. Um, two key items or matters of emphasis also align with our emphasis of a matter of uh, uh, paragraphs in the opinion. Um, so that is the existence and valuation of investments, particularly the alternative investments where we performed um, audit procedures to, to address the, the valuation of the alternative investment portfolio, as well as the existence. We also evaluated the actuarial assumptions going into the total pension and total OPEB liability. Um, the, the next bullet is uh, related to uh, impacts of COVID-19. So the, the pandemic is, is over. However, there has been a return to office. And um, us as auditors, we changed our audit approach so that we were on site this year doing internal walkthroughs directly with management. Um, as well as during year-end field work, we were on site um, to have the face-to-face -face interactions with, with the client or with, with the entity. Um, we also evaluated significant accounting policies and, and management judgments um, and did not identify any, uh, disc any policies or estimates that were not appropriate for, for the entity. Um, we also are required to communicate our judgment about the qualitative aspects of the significant accounting practices, um, as well as any corrected or uncorrected misstatements. So we're happy to inform you there were no uncorrected or corrected misstatements. We do have a bullet highlighting the, the fair value of alternative investments. That is a common proposed uncorrected misstatement that we have, have uh, had in the past. This year, management's estimate was uh, in alignment with the, the values reported by the investment managers and general partners of the alternative uh, investment portfolio. Um, so there is no uncorrected misstatement. Um, other communications are detailed on the right-hand side. I'm not going to go over each of them, but there is no um, significant issues or anything to highlight that's not normal course of business for the audit uh, um, related to the other items. 
So we did evaluate the information, uh, other information contained in the financial statements, um, did not identify any material inconsistencies or discrepancies with the, the financial report. Um, we did not encounter any significant uh, difficulties with management, no significant issues discussed, um, or have any disagreements with management. Um, and, the, and the last deliverable from our audit is uh, required by the governmental auditing standards. Um, so the independent auditors report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters. Um, so as part of conducting our audit, we obtained an understanding of the entity and the environment, including internal controls, in order to appropriately plan for the audit. We did not uh, perform any uh, procedures to address the operating effectiveness, and therefore we are not expressing an opinion on internal controls. Um, however, during our uh, consideration of internal controls, um, or during our evaluation of internal controls, we did not identify any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. However, there was a limitation to our approach that if we were opining on the effectiveness of internal controls, we might have identified we could have potentially identified significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, but we did not perform the procedures to, to, to make those conclusions. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jen. Thanks, Dan. So uh, the last part of the presentation was focused on our audit of the financial statements. Now we're going to switch over and talk about our audit of the other pension information or the schedule of proportionate share. So a lot of this will be uh, similar to what uh, Kevin and Dan just discussed. So we'll hit on the highlights of differences or uh, emphasis or spe uh, specification to the other pension information here. We actually... <clears throat> excuse me, perform our audit procedures uh, concurrently in uh, working through this report and, and our ultimate issuance of an opinion. Uh, it's important to note that the other pension information is not actually required by generally accepted uh, accounting principles, but management has made the decision to issue this other pension information to allow your contributing entities to have the information necessary to include in their financial statements uh, that are audited and, and ultimately issued annually. And the opinion that we provide provides a higher level of evidence for those other auditors. Because this is not required information or part of a basic financial statement, we do include in our opinion a restriction on use. And so this just clarifies that this uh, report or, or this uh, other information is not meant for general distribution and use by the general public. It's really for the use of management and your contributing entities. Because of the, um, the level of detail here, we just took a snip here of the end of the schedule, but really this goes through by contributing entity and details out the contribution, and then ultimately uh, includes the non-employer contributing entity uh, to reconcile those uh, contributions for the year back to your annual financial statement. So quite a bit of detail included here. And the uh, proportionate share by employer as part of that calculation and information presented. Again, with the focus on the employers and the use of this information for their financial statements, uh, there's also uh, quite a bit of information included related to the total and net pension liability. Uh, so this information presented is consistent with the financial statements for the system and then is utilized by those employers. In looking at our uh, independent auditor's report in relation to this, uh, we are actually focusing our audit procedures and issuing our opinion related to the schedule of proportionate share, the total uh, net pension liability included, <coughs> and then specific captions for the deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows of resources. And so consistent with the financial statement audit, uh, this audit is also performed under both frameworks, generally accepted and governmental uh, auditing standards, and we've issued uh, unmodified opinions both for this and the uh, internal control opinion that we will get to in a moment here. Uh, we do include the same emphasis of matter information because of the presentation of the total and net pension liability uh, within these uh, schedules. And so, again, this is very consistent with what we just reviewed for the financial statement audit. 
we are also required to communicate to you in your role of uh, those charged with governance. And again, this is very uh, consistent information. And so um, just to highlight here, really we're focused in on the revenue recognition policy for the uh, contributions, as well as the presentation of that information and kind of the unwinding of some of the special legislation from prior years. And then looking uh, specifically at those captions, again, for deferred inflows, deferred outflows, uh, and that detail for the uh, schedule proportionate share. Uh, we did not have any corrected or uncorrected misstatements through the performance of this work and also found uh, management's uh, judgment or use of um, accounting practices and policies to be very consistent and in line with industry expectation and have no other matters to report regarding any sort of difficulty or uh, other communications or concerns. Similarly, we also have a secondary report that we include. And uh, again, there were no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses identified as we evaluated management's internal control structure over financial reporting for this other pension information. And that concludes our prepared remarks, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Okay. okay, well, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you to the presenter. It's a great morning, especially when uh, <clears throat> you start the morning with this was an excellent audit. So, uh, so that's congratulations to, to, the, uh, to the folks, to Cheryl and, and her team. Um, having said that, by the way, I need to also, yesterday we... Uh, Treasurer give an A++, so today we cannot uh, deviate from that. So A++ to the whole, uh, to the whole team for the uh, unmodified opinion, excellent audit, and so on and so forth. The question, <clears throat> so what happened to the internal control findings, do you know, on member data integrity? Was that fixed? And could it reoccur again in the future? And if so, under what circumstances they might reoccur? That is an excellent question. So again, I'm going to frame it in, we have three levels of deficiencies, material weaknesses, which means that the internal controls have such a gap that a material, a material misstatement could exist within the financial statements and the internal controls would not identify it. A significant deficiency, which is not a material weakness, but still worthy of the attention of those charged with governance, and then deficiency in internal control. Now, internal controls are designed to provide reasonable, not absolute assurance. Uh, so that's kind of key concept one. And the second key concept is that the price of implementing the controls should not weigh the benefit that you gain by implementing the internal controls. Over the course of the, since our relationship with, with CalSTRS has begun, we have either had a material weakness, significant deficiency, and then ultimately a deficiency as it relates to the member data. We believe that the level of internal controls that have now been put in place by a variety of members of management, including audit services, financial reporting, member services, et cetera, that those, any, mater any material misstatement would be identified. And for that matter, a, any level of exceptions beyond the normative would also be identified by management. The conditions still exist. Teacher's retirement law is difficult to implement. Um, over the course of your 1,700 contributing entities, the level of expertise and experience of those responding and identifying what's covered comp and what's not covered comp, those errors continue and will continue. But we believe that management has a system of internal controls that, again, would identify anything out of the normative. So this is a win. The deficiency went away. Um, but, Mr. Rafino, if, if the exceptions started going back up and were excessive, 
the deficiency would, would reappear. So it's not mission accomplished, but it is definitely a, a win for the organization. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, along the same lines as um, Mr. Rufino, uh, it's a it's a good day to celebrate when you have an unqualified opinion, and and um, it's not just the audit team that per, um, performed the audit, and not just Cheryl's team who's the internal auditor, but it's also the entire organization. It's a, a management, it's the staff. It comes all the way from the bottom to the top. And so um, while it's great to know that it's unqualified and no management letter, um, my, my one comment would be don't let your guard down because um, now that you're you know, good, sometimes people tend to kind of think we're good. And, um, and that's when kind of to Frank's point, um, material weaknesses may resurface because we are not monitoring our controls as we had and, um, and we let things slip and then we get back in the same situation. So congrats to everyone, congrats to the entire management team and all the staff who, um, who made this possible to have a, a, a great report like that. My second question, and I, I think you've heard this from me before, is now we'll, we'll do this again. And um, when you go to perform the next audit, which I'm happy to hear that you came on site, I think that is incredibly important as an audit team to um, actually talk to people in person, not by a way of a computer screen. I think a lot can be gained from that impersonal um, engagement and also things, um, the, the um, observation is very keen when you're in person. Um, so going forward, um, and just another comment, and I'm just gonna raise it again, is just making sure that when we move forward with the next audit team, that we're recirculating, we're putting newer people in so that we always have fresh eyes, fresh questioning minds who are always looking um, to make sure that the internal controls and, and there are no internal weaknesses. Um, so great job to everybody, and uh, hopefully it continues for next year too. We will take your observations, and, and that is part of our audit process and applying professional skepticism. Each year has to stand alone. We will um, allow management to celebrate today, but from that point forward, we'll start talking about fiscal year 2024, and it's a clean slate. Yes. And the one reminder I always share is we work with management. We work for you. Um, as members of the audit and risk management team, uh, you are the people who engage us and, and we report directly to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just um, lend my full support to what Ms. Whitaker just said um, and to what Mr. Rafino said, so I don't need to repeat it. Um, two questions. Um, one has to do with if you could put a little color around uh, the valuations of the private asset classes as they've become a larger proportion of our investments. Um, just maybe a little color around how you look at those valuations and dialogue back and forth. And then secondly, my second question is uh, for next year's audit, do you see any changes in the staffing that Crow will bring to uh, this audit for this coming year, and uh, specifically any changes in the management team? Uh, will we see different faces? How are you thinking about that? Thanks. So I will deal with the second question first. It's the easiest. Uh, like all public accounting firms, we, we have attrition, both through promotion as well as, unfortunately, sometimes people leave the firm. Our commitment to Calsters has always been that we're going to put the best and brightest myself excluded from that, um, on the engagement team to serve, serve you. You're very important and a critical client of the firm. We will have new staff, new managers. The leadership team, I anticipate, will be consistent with those that have served you in the past. But again, kind of that fresh faces and, and different perspective, those are the people who are actually doing a lot of the work and it provides a fresh perspective. So although they're following prior year work papers, they have a different kind of questioning mind because they're learning the processes as well. Um, and I think it really improves the overall effectiveness and the efficiency of the engagement. With respect to the investment valuation, particularly for those that are the alternative investments, as Dan alluded to. So we really have two focal points um, from an audit objective standpoint. First is the existence 
The second is the valuation. So the existence, it, it can really be done in one way and one way only effectively and efficiently, and that's confirmation that you do, in fact, own these investments. And we take a two-pronged approach. We confirm 100% of the portfolio with State Street. However, State Street doesn't really have custody of those alternative investments. So we do a sample and, and perform confirmations with your general partners to understand, yes, in fact, you have that ownership percentage of the, of the fund, as well as what are the underlying assets of the fund. From a risk assessment standpoint, we treat that to be a high risk with limited internal controls. And although I would argue that the controls exist, we're trying to drive as large of a sample number as we can to just generate more audit evidence. So that's step one, confirming existence. From a valuation standpoint, again, we've assessed risk at the highest level possible level, which drives a larger sample size um, than what if we had assessed risk as being lower. So that drives sample sizes, and from that point forward, you're really looking at what has the general, um, the general partner estimated the fair value to be, and then what co corroborating evidence, either in the positive or the negative, exists that could make you believe that those valuations are inappropriate in a sufficient manner. So that could be the underlying investments, it could be subsequent events, a variety of different things that could call into question that fair value. Management also has a process of kind of identifying what they believe fair value to be at a portfolio level versus just the general partnership level. And we test the inputs as well as the reasonableness of the assumptions there as well to, to conclude that we believe that the, that the estimate is not unreasonable. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Any further questions? Oh, Mr. Rapino, did not see that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick, I got two other quick questions. Um, first one, <clears throat> uh, whether you know if there is any significant new GASP rules in the financial reporting that perhaps will affect next year financial statements. And this, the other question, if you could, maybe comment on the proposed changes in ASG reporting requirements and how they will be affecting our financial statements going forward. First and foremost, our, our friends in Norwalk have been relatively quiet for the past few years. Uh, they have a variety of projects on their agenda that will have a significant impact upon general purpose governments. The things that have been issued in recent years have very limited impact upon a public employee retirement system, so that's the good news for you guys. Nor do I see anything on the horizon, and by horizon I'd say three to five years, that I think will have a significant impact upon um, the GASB. They are um, currently doing a post-issuance review, I believe that's the, the title that they give, to both um, GASB 67 and 74, which did have a significant impact. It's where they talk to auditors, preparers, users, and try to understand what worked, what didn't, should there be any changes. By reading tea leaves, I think that post-employment, or that post-implementation review will have limited impact upon those. I don't anticipate any new standards to come forth. From an ESG reporting standpoint, the biggest news in the world would be what the state of California has passed. Um, but that has exempted you. So it does not apply to state, to state and local governments within the state based upon my reading as well as a variety of experts within the firm. So I do not believe that it will have an impact upon your financial reporting. Um, I hesitate to say this, but from a, you guys are very active in the market to what extent those companies you invest in that now have to provide this, will they knock on your door and say, why don't you? And you guys do from a certain perspective, but I think it could have a, a potential indirect effect, but nothing direct as of this moment. Two great answers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Yatman, we would love to hear what you have to tell us and my, any my further turn. questions. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is just the best time of year, isn't it? That the evenings are cool and crisp and you get to curl up with a nice set of financial statements by a fire. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm 
uh, you know, I'm an old auditor, an old army sergeant, and some of the words of Miss Whitaker ring uh, so true, which are every year we start over. But let, today, let's celebrate a, a really wonderful audit, a great set of results. And then tomorrow, let's forget all that. And we start with a clean slate again. And that's the attitude that I have. And I believe that's the attitude that your auditors share as well. So um, uh, Mr. Rufino, it's, it's, you know, we hit the century mark. So these GASB pronouncements are numbered. They started at one, although that's all gone. And they go up by number. Well, hallelujah, this year we reached 100. So they have issued 100 and 101, but they're pretty innocuous, as, as, uh, as Mr. Smith noted. Um, let's see what else. I believe Mr. Smith's response to the question on ESG was, was wonderful and correct, which is that uh, I concur that it will have no direct effect on your financial statements. However, it will have a significant impact on the financial statements of your investee organizations, which is an issue, of course, for an, a, a committee other than, than this one. But um, uh, it's, it's good for you to be on the front edge of that as it works its way into organizations' financial statements in the near future. And, and um, as this organization thinks about what would that, could that possibly mean for you in, in the future? Uh, got that, got that. All right, now on to the not so fun questions. Mr. Smith, I have some questions for you. Could you describe the level of staff cooperation with the audit, please? Excellent. Um, an audit is a very iterative, iterative, I can't say that word, process. Uh, we request numerous documents through our central request exchange site. I'd say in excess of over a thousand requests uh, that we make of management to provide documentation throughout the engagement. Uh, that's probably a small number, particularly if I think about the 100 school districts. Uh, management has provided an excellent team of project managers, both from financial reporting as well as the investments. We meet with them on a weekly basis to understand due dates of our request, anything that's lingering, why is it lingering, can a different due date be established, and that's never a because I just couldn't do it in time for you, Crow. It is they are waiting on an external party to provide that information. Um, but management responded excellent to us throughout the engagement. Thank you for that. Do you believe that you had complete unfettered access to management at all levels yes. when conducting your audit? Yes. Was there any instance where you did not? No. Other than the CFO, whose job it is to have a good understanding of what an external financial audit is, of what your job is, what your role is, um, do you believe that the rest of management has a reasonable understanding of your role as auditor? I do. And can you describe the tone at the top, at the very top, with respect to financial reporting, as well as the necessity for a strong set of internal controls? So tone at the top really starts with the board and, and very quickly becomes delegated to the ARM committee. Um, we have had direct access um, to ARM. Um, that can be from a, we present our audit plan to you, we meet with you separately, discuss various risks that you might have identified within the financial statements. I believe that you have established an appropriate tone at the top. That permeates its way down through the C-suite into middle management as well as all employees of the organization. Um, I laugh and I think maybe it's artificial intelligence following me around, but I don't know that I've ever got on the elevator um, in the Calster's Tower without seeing something reminding employees of the importance of internal controls. I don't know if it's always there or just coming off of my badge, but um, <laughs> it, it's impressive. You know, over the course of 12 to 13 years, I've mentioned that we've had material weaknesses, we've had significant deficiencies. I really believe it was based upon what ARM, as well as the C-suite, saying this is not acceptable and building a level of, of a commitment to an appropriate control environment. Well, you answered my next question, which was, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. Yeah, because I get to. Um, describe the tone at the top, and since you mentioned C-suite, that's what I'm asking about. Um, their understanding of the role of an internal control system in the organization? 
So, you know, internal controls exist to do both to, in my mind, at its most simplistic terms, it is to safeguard assets as well as provide assurance over the level of, of financial reporting. Um, management, C-suite and below, understand the importance of those internal controls. Uh, they are both within the technology systems or the financially significant systems that are utilized, a variety of automated controls, as well as um, manual controls. So reviews, reconciliations, approvals. Uh, management is completely supportive of the internal control structure. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So I'd like to make a comment with respect to Mr. Rufino's question, which is, um, why did this, why did the findings on internal control, what started out many years ago as a material weakness and then it migrated down to now it's not there. Does that mean that the, all the issues with member data were corrected? Clearly not. And I think it's important to understand how those errors can arise. It, and imagine, if you will, uh, LA Unified School District, and it's, you're the person whose responsibility it is to enter this information into a system and code it whether or not it's creditable or not creditable compensation. And teacher's retirement law is very complicated, as is compensation. It's not just a straight salary. There are lots of ways that teachers are compensated through special, well, there's lots of ways. And it's someone's responsibility to code everything just the right way and if you can imagine the complexity of this, mistakes are going to arise. Innocent mistakes are part of human nature and part of who we are is what, and that's how those creep in. And there's, there's staff turnover that individuals have to work with. There's training that they have to work with. Often their only job is not coding <laughs> compensation. They might go teach a class that afternoon and come back in and have to do this. So these mistakes um, are, are they're going to be there. They're just always going to be there. So the question is, well, then what's changed? Where, where did they go? Why aren't we talking about them anymore? And Mr. Smith answered very eloquently. And uh, so forgive me for, for piling on to that eloquent answer, but the answer is um, it's management's actions. It's nothing the auditor did. It's, it's nothing I did. It's nothing the board did. It's what management did. And management chose to say, okay, what do we do to, uh, to, to make this not go away, but to understand it better. And that's how it started many years ago um, with your prior, uh, at the time, chief operating officer, um, who has since become your executive officer. And uh, with, an, with an intentional uh, goal of trying to understand where do these errors creep in? How do they happen? And can they become material? And if so, under what circumstance? And so from an auditor's perspective, when management uh, has a good understanding of a potential weakness, that in itself is a really powerful mitigation tool because to know what you don't know is really, really powerful. And that's what happened. It's, it's action by management. And so uh, I, I'm personally very grateful for management's actions. But next year's a brand new year. And without a consistent um, not letting your guard down, as you said, then yeah, it could easily come back. And I think these auditors, in my opinion, wouldn't have any qualms whatsoever of bringing that finding back, none whatsoever, in my opinion. All right, so now if, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, I'd like to, um, yeah, it's a pretty long list, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it short. I'd like to recognize uh, some staff members by name who, uh, you know, the, the uh, so um, you're, CEO, uh, CFO is responsible ultimately for putting these financial statements together, but I can, I can tell you she did not do it on her own. There are so many people that are working hard to gather these numbers and put them together from year to year. So with your permission, I'd like to go through a, a list. All right, well, certainly it starts at the top with your C, uh, CFO, Julie Underwood. And as you know, Julie is in her, I forget, five, five? Close enough to five. Yeah, um, years, which is not that long. And so uh, she has most certainly uh, taken control of the financial reporting process. And as we see, it has, it has gone swimmingly well. But in particular, there were some folks in audit services that really helped coordinate the audit 
with our, our audit, with the, uh, the Crow audit team, Marlene Noss, and of course, our own Cheryl Dietz, worked to make sure that uh, meetings were taking place on time, that there was in-person contact this year that will, will be maintained next year. And I'm very thankful to both Marlene and to Cheryl. Within the financial statement preparation, sort of where the rubber hits the road, gathering these numbers, um, in the financial planning, accounting, and reporting branch, long name, is Art Martinez, whose name you hear, well, about every 12 months. <laughs> but Art, was, Art wasn't alone in working in that. He was uh, assisted by Banky uh, Futunla, Kelly Mariano, and Chris Hunter, who worked, again, in the financial statement preparation. In investments, as you know, as you've heard, investments is a significant part of your asset portfolio and assisting with all those confirmations from State Street and other places were a couple of people, uh, Melissa Duranco and Katie Lee, were both really instrumental in providing reams of information so that the auditors can ascertain those values of, as Dan said, difficult to value assets. That other pension information, that second audit that went through, um, as, as was noted, that's not a required audit. And I applaud the organization for doing this audit because otherwise you can imagine the school districts would quite frankly be left to fend for themselves when it came to deciding what share of the liability they should put on their financial statements. Interestingly, they don't have to use the number that you give them, but I suspect that most would choose to use that number. Well, that information didn't collect itself. And so there's a team of people, uh, in particular, Jeannie Liu and Cassie Malabek, and uh, Cassie has a team, a whole team <laughs> that works putting this proportionate share uh, together. That team is, consists of Nick Lang, Soon Nam Tran, Kabao Yang, Wen Wen, Brian Giore, and Sanjit Singh. That's a pretty decent sized team. Well, because there's a lot of numbers to pull together and to get it right, because the school districts really depend on this information. Then there's service retirement, Anthony Carlos and Patrick Browning. These numbers are used to help assist calculate uh, the, the liability um, side. And then, as you know, we have all these school districts audit that, that Cheryl will talk about uh, and is, is in the report. And part of the feedback me mechanism, so you do an audit, you find mistakes. Okay, what do we do with that? Well, we wanted to have a feedback loop that actively works with the school districts to correct those going forward. And there's an uh, aptly named audit resolution team that works with this. And that team is uh, Sue Zhang, Scott, I'm going to, Scott, forgive me for saying this right, but I think I'm going to get it, Herber Spocker, and Zach Davis. This team is responsible for making sure that those, oh, I'm sorry, and Janet McMahon. Sorry, Janet. Uh, making sure that, that those audit reports get back to the school districts in a way that are constructive to minimize the mistakes going forward. And then finally, uh, I'll finish with actuarial resources. So someone has to come up with these uh, uh, estimates and the assumptions that go into coming up with the, the actuarial estimate of the liability. And of course, that is um, your primary person is, is Rick Reed, who has been with you for many reliable years of service, but Rick doesn't do it alone. He's assisted by David Lemero and uh, Jordan Fassler. So thank you very much. I'm really grateful for all the staff that have worked so hard to flow up this information into what is a wonderful set of financial statements. And next year's a fresh year. Thank you very much. We have one more question for Mr. Keeley. I just want to thank uh, Professor Yetman for acknowledging and recognizing the people that are responsible for uh, bringing this great report before us. Everyone matters, and we're grateful to them for being part of the team. We, we don't get to see most of the people that work in this organization. They are valued. They are appreciated. Thank you for recognizing And I will be brief, but I'm just going to me too, all my colleagues. Thank you all and all the people who are listening who helped. Um, and thank you guys for coming out. I know travel is not always easy and we appreciate you being on site and coming out and checking on things. Um, we have um, a proposed resolution. Do we need to take a roll call vote on that? 
Oh, before that, okay. Do we have any statements from the public? We have no members of the public in the queue. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Well, I just, so there's a, someone in the audience I just wanted to recognize briefly, if you, if you don't mind. So as you know, Crow is an international organization, very large organization, and uh, they have a leadership team at the top is this, this, this leader. But um, what's really pretty neat is that the original signing partner for this audit more than a few years ago, uh, her name is Brenda, and Brenda was promoted to be the, I, I think her title is Chief Operating Officer, which literally means second in command of Crow International. Well, as you can imagine, Brenda's been quite busy since she received her promotion. However, she did find the time to join us today. Somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Congratulations and thank you for coming to say hi. <laughs> it was nice to get to say hi. <laughs> okay, I think we've taken care of everything and we need to do a roll call vote on the proposed resolution to accept the audit. Controller Cohen? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Keeley? Aye. Mr. Rafino? Yes. Ms. Whitaker? Aye. Chairperson Bradford, would you care to vote? Sure, I. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Item number six is the management letter with Ms. Cervantes and Ms. Underwood. In the sense that um, in the years past, we've, if there were a deficiency, it would be reported to management through a management letter, and then management felt in an effort to be transparent, they always presented it to the ARM committee. And please report that Crow did not issue a management letter, but I wanted to give Julie as management an opportunity to um, say a few words. Thank you, Cheryl. Julie Underwood, Chief Financial Officer. I'm not sure I'm gonna have the right words today to express just how proud I am of staff in achieving this result. You know, not having a deficiency in a management letter really is a huge accomplishment for an organization our size. And I also want to thank Dr. Yetman for recognizing many of our staff who do work so hard on our audit. There's also many other staff throughout the organization. This really is a team effort that works so hard and, and are dedicated to producing high quality financial statements for our members. They also work tirelessly, as was mentioned, on the endless requests sometimes that we feel like we get from our auditors um, to go through the audit process. Um, but we, I do want to assure you that we will remain vigilant tomorrow, um, but we certainly want to celebrate today. And so on behalf of the executive team, I would like to thank our amazing staff for this achievement. And I'd like to ask the audit committee to join me in recognizing staff for this notable accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for item six? Great. And anyone have questions? Any comments from the public? Okay, great. On to item number seven, enterprise risk management. You're already here, how wonderful. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Thank you. So I'll kick us off. Uh, <laughs> Chair Bradford, members of the committee, Julie Underwood, Chief Financial Officer, and I'm here with Lynn Bashaw. She is our Director over Enterprise Risk Management and Compliance Services. And Lynn is gonna be presenting to you our 18-month maturity plan for our risk and compliance programs. But before she does, I would love to introduce to you our new compliance manager, Megan Hatfield. Megan's gonna stand up. This is an internal promotion for Megan. She has worked with our compliance unit for over three years, and she is a certified compliance and ethics professional. So we're really excited to have Megan take on this new role to help us with our maturity goals. So thank you, Megan. Yay, Megan! 
All right, I'd also like to remind you that maturing our risk management model is a strategic plan initiative. And so to accomplish that next level of maturity that we're looking for, for both our, our risk and compliance programs, we need to be thinking about how do we continually improve how we identify and address the risks that we face in this organization, as well as how, how do we expand how we promote a culture of ethics and compliance throughout the organization. And so Lynn and her team have been working really hard to put this plan together, so I do want to thank them um, for their hard work and dedication in, in making sure that we're reaching that next level of, of maturity uh, in these programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to her to provide you with the details of our plan. Thank you, Julie. Oh, thank you. The clicker, my favorite, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh. Nope, that is not the right slide. There we go. So I want to talk first. Got the, there we go. I like to be amplified. Okay. I want to talk first a little bit about the maturity enhancement process itself. How did we get here? How did we go about creating this plan? This process started last year with developing long range maturity targets for where we wanted to be on the maturity scale in comparison to where we are now. I'll show you the scale on the next slide, but first, as a reminder, back in March, we presented the results of a maturity assessment that was completed by a consultant, Weaver. They gave us several recommendations for maturing enterprise risk, our enterprise risk and compliance programs. As Julie mentioned, the enterprise risk and compliance teams evaluated all of those recommendations and used that to draft an 18-month maturity plan. We chose an 18-month timeframe because we felt 12 months was too short and just didn't give us enough time to measure and demonstrate progress towards our goal. In evaluating the recommendations, we considered several criteria that included ease of implementation, the order of implementation, impact to other business areas, resource requirements, and timing. We determined which recommendations to implement now in this 18-month plan, which to implement in a future plan, and which we wanted to hold off and reevaluate for, for a future plan. We presented our plan to the executive team, to our Risk Champion Network, to get their feedback and their insight. We outlined a multi-year staffing plan to support the maturity plan. And the last step is that we're going to, as we implement the plan, we're going to assess and report on our progress, any challenges, and then we're going to adjust as needed. Nope. Nope. There we go. <laughs> so this slide shows the maturity scale. The maturity levels go from left to right. The more mature a program is, the higher it is on the maturity scale. This is where our consultant, Weaver, determined our programs were on the maturity scale. So this is essentially our starting point. This is where we're at today. Enterprise compliance services is at the repeatable level and enterprise risk management is at the defined level. Keep in mind, there isn't anything inherently wrong with being here, nothing's broken. But there are certainly benefits that can be achieved by moving up in the maturity scale and investing in these programs, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But again, the takeaway here is this is where we're at right now. This is our starting point. So this is our target. This is our target state of maturity. This is where I wanna take us with these programs over the next few years. This is the goal I'm proposing. The plan I'm presenting today though, doesn't get us here. The maturity plan is just one step towards this larger goal. So you may be wondering, why is enterprise compliance services only at the managed level? Uh, why aren't we aiming for that optimized for both programs? Well, it's because there's trade-offs associated with maturing all the way to that optimized level. The trade-offs are that maturing typically comes with increased costs and complexity and I wanna see how it goes before we fully commit to bringing enterprise compliance services all the way to that optimized level. I wanna be slow and measured in our maturity process so that we bring the whole organization with us. My recommendation is that we aim for manage in the enterprise compliance services for now, 
which is still a very mature state, and then reevaluate that in the future. So now that we've talked about the overall big picture, the maturity process, what are we gonna get by maturing these programs? How does that help our organization? How does that help our members? Some benefits of increasing ERM, enterprise risk management maturity, evolving from a defined risk management approach to a higher level of enterprise risk management maturity brings several benefits. As we mature, we will be better equipped to anticipate and mitigate risks improve our strategic decision-making, and optimize resource allocation. Higher ERM maturity levels are designed to reduce operational disruptions, ultimately leading to more efficient and sustainable operations. Benefits of increased compliance maturity include fostering a mature compliance and ethical culture, which is essential in maintaining the integrity of an organization, also, employees who feel that they're part of an ethical work environment are more likely to be engaged and motivated. This leads to increased productivity, lower turnover, and a positive reputation. Really, the overall benefit of maturing these programs is that being informed about risks helps us to make strategic decisions that support a well-governed, financially sound trust fund. So now let's get into the maturity plans. This is the fun stuff. So <laughs> here you see the respective models that the programs were evaluated against and that we will use to measure progress. These models are widely recognized and respected frameworks. Uh, and adopting them will help us adhere to global industry standards, which in turn enhances our program's reputation and our credibility. These models you'll notice have a lot in common which is why you often see risk and compliance organizationally under one umbrella. But as there are two models, we developed two maturity plans, one for enterprise risk, one for enterprise compliance. Another reason for developing two plans is because they were in a different state of maturity. So this is in your agenda materials. Here's the 18-month maturity plan for enterprise risk management. I'm not going to read all the, <laughs> all the information here, but I am just going to go ahead and highlight some of the initiatives and kind of give you an overview of the plan. The column on the left is the components from the model we just saw. The plan is set up in three phases, so roughly six months each. Phase one for enterprise risk focuses on risk appetite statements and acquiring and deploying a software solution that can help streamline some of our ERM processes. Phase two focuses on stakeholder and staff education, developing some key risk indicators that tie back to the risk appetite statements. Phase three embeds risk appetite as an integral part of strategy in assessing performance measures. And in case anyone's wondering what is risk appetite or how to apply it, don't worry, uh, as part of implementing this plan, we've already have risk appetite as an agenda item for your March meeting. Uh, we already have that as a workshop item. So, so you have that uh, as an upcoming uh, workshop. So this slide shows how we will demonstrate progress to you in the component categories and the maturity goals as we implement the maturity plan. The solid bars are where we currently are and then the open arrows are what we hope to achieve over the next 18 months. As we report on our progress, you should see these open bars start to fill in. You will notice though that this maturity plan again does not take us all the way to the target of optimizing. This is intentional. It will take us a number of years to get there. This is just the first of many maturity plans uh, that will help get us to that goal. So similarly, here's the 18-month maturity plan for enterprise compliance services. Again, excuse me. Again, there were two separate plans, one for enterprise risk, one for enterprise compliance. This is the plan for compliance based on the compliance model. Phase one for compliance focuses on updating the framework and charter, developing an internal procedure manual, 
phase two focuses on conducting an inventory of our compliance assurance activities across the organization, aligning our enterprise risk and compliance risk assessments. It also includes developing the beginnings of a monitoring program, which includes identifying some key policies for testing. Phase three includes implementing some of that policy testing. You'll notice that much of this 18 month compliance plan is about laying the groundwork for a compliance program, really building the foundation for our team. We've also left some capacity to support the third party risk management program being led by legal services. And here's the progress slide for enterprise compliance services. Again, the solid bars show where we currently are on the maturity scale in each of the components for the compliance program. The open arrows show where we hope to be uh, by the end of the maturity plan. Again, you'll notice this doesn't take us all the way to the end of the target. It's gonna take us a while to get there. You may also notice that there is no maturity plan open arrow for enforcement and response. This is intentional. These are very sensitive and technical areas. And I would like to first build the foundation of the program a little bit more before we dive into these more sensitive and technical areas. So you'll see these uh, most likely on some future plans. But our next maturity plan will iteratively build on this one and so on until we reach the target. So next steps. Next steps are to work with our business partners to implement the plans, provide you and the Executive Risk and Compliance Committee with some regular reporting on how we're doing. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to suggest just a little bit of a change. Over the last few years, Enterprise Compliance Services has been providing activity reports to this committee. However, many of these processes like policy administration, hotline administration have now been operationalized. And I haven't had any concerns with these processes uh, from a compliance perspective. So unless there are any objections, my recommendation is to pause on providing these regular activity reports and instead just provide these maturity plan reports. Um, I feel like they're more informative and more at the level um, that you would like to see instead of the regular activity reports, which will still be provided to the executive team. Um, and if there's anything that I feel that you should know about, I can still provide verbal updates to this committee. So that's, that's always still an option. Um, and as a reminder, uh, coming up, we already have a risk appetite workshop on your ARM agenda for March, and the framework and compliance charter updates are scheduled for the May meeting. In conclusion, this 18-month plan aligns CalSTRS with industry standards, deploys ERM software for efficiency, enhances our overall maturity levels, strengthens our compliance framework, and fosters an ethical culture. The team and I are really excited about these programs and about bringing this maturity plan to life over the next 18 months. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Um, any questions? I'm not seeing any yet, no? Good, Dr. Getman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Bashaw, for your energy and enthusiasm. So I, I really want to um, point out that it, it wasn't required that management adopt a compliance program. This was a choice. And um, I applaud that choice. And uh, as you know, so just not to be repetitive, but compliance plays a very different role from audits, although they're both being presented here simultaneously, and it would be easy to sort of associate the two as being somewhat equivalent. There's certainly overlap, but they have two very different objectives. So uh, the way, one, one way to think of it as well, you know, where the financial statements, you know, the buck stops with, well, the buck stops right there, right? And with respect to auditing, the buck stops right here with misdeeds. But with respect to compliance, the buck does not stop there. Instead, really, Ms. Bashaw's role is to assist the organization in adopting an overall compliance perspective at, the, at every level within the organization. So it's more of an assistive role working within the organization. And so to do that in a way that um, um, puts down strong roots first before you allow the leaves to grow is important. And then also to consider disruption on, on management, to try to integrate with the management units in every management unit within the organization in a way that doesn't 
conflict with, it's not like there's no compliance, right? In fact, for example, investments has a very mature and highly functioning compliance unit. And so you wouldn't want to uh, uh, duplicate efforts were not necessary, right? And so it's really compliance is something that it, there's accounting standards that tell Ms. Underwood what those financial statements need to look like, right? There are auditing standards that tell Ms. Dietz what an audit is supposed to consist of. But compliance, there's no, at least nobody wrote a book that I'm aware of that says, thou shalt do compliance this way. It's really very specific to the organization and it needs to comply with the uniqueness of each organization. So it's, it's really a very different function, although I believe this is the right place to put it, and it's the right place to bring reports to, it's the right committee, it's a highly functioning committee. But it has a very different role. And so I applaud the 18 month, I think I would call that aspirational. I, I, if, if everything doesn't happen within 18 months, well, if it did, I'd be surprised. But uh, b because you don't know what you're gonna run up against when you start to roll this out. So I think we need to keep that in mind, that it's it's an aspirational goal. And I would prefer the uh, put down strong roots, go slow approach. Make sure you get it done right in a non-invasive way that doesn't duplicate efforts. And I know that that's what the team believes as well. And so um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking us on this journey. We look forward to hearing back and seeing how the 18 months go. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? Any comments from the public? There are no members of the public in the queue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Item number eight, Ms. Cervantes, Ms. O'Young, and Mr. Wall. This is an action item. This one is? Mm -hmm. Hi. All right. So item eight is an action item requesting your approval for our 2024 six month audit plan. And the reason we're requesting a six month plan is because we want to transition from a calendar year to a fiscal year. Uh, moving to a fiscal year really allows us to better align with the board schedule, but most importantly, with enterprise risk, enterprise compliance, and financial reporting periods. So here with me today is Chris Wall, Assistant Director over Employer Audits, and Roseanne O. Young, Assistant Director of Internal Audits. And they will assist me in this presentation where we will be discussing the audit plan development, our risk assessment processes, the proposed plan, six month plan for 2024. And then we'll conclude with just a few brief updates on our 2023 plan and request approval of our six month 2024 plan. Professional standards for internal auditing require that we develop a risk-based audit plan, which allows audit services to set our priorities to the highest risk areas, ensure we have the sufficient resources to complete that plan, and also allows us to remain flexible to accommodate any request and any changing priority for the organization. The audit plan development process also um, considers various inputs from internal and external resources that um, allows us to remain consistent with the organization goals and ensure that we're considering the enterprise risks. I'm gonna hand it over to Chris and Roseanne to talk briefly about their risk assessment process. So as we bridge the gap between moving from a audit risk, uh, an audit plan based on a calendar year to the audit plan based on a fiscal year, we're, we've developed a six month audit plan and when, as we do that, we're really leveraging our prior year's audit plan as we develop it. If you recall from previous meetings, we identified the top 200 employers at our last um, audit plan um, meeting where we basically took those 200 audit audits. We have completed about 100, 110 of those audits where, or, that are either completed or in progress. And that leaves about 90 that haven't been audited yet. Audited yet. We are also... Um, leveraging the results of the Crow audit into our current audit or our upcoming audit plan. And part of the Crow audit when they look at GASB 67 is they complete testing where they're looking at areas such as membership, compensation, census data, and they take that to make sure that the actuarial evaluations are correct. Um, 
And while they do identify some misreporting, the misreporting at this point has been immaterial, so it didn't have any impact. But that doesn't mean it's correct either. So we're taking the results that they provide us as part of that uh, as part of their their audit, and we're incorporating that into our risk assessment. And from there, we actually um, are developing the current the risk assessment for the six month audit plan. But we're going to continue to use the results of the Crow audit as we go forward. So this will just be this will be a permanent thing where we're always taking the results of the Crow audit, and it will be incorporated into our risk assessment. And for the internal audits risk assessment, we considered both external factors and internal factors. For those external factors, we included information from. Yes, I need to get closer. <laughs> um, for our external factors, we included information from our consultants as well as um, industry risk, which is gathered from other audit professionals. And for our internal factors, we included information from discussions from our internal audit leaders as well as internal auditors. So the results of those, um, these, both of these risk assessments allowed us to develop our six-month plan, which includes the employer audits, internal audits, other activity, audit activities, which things um, that is like the follow up on those findings we had, make sure they're resolved, our quality assurance and improvement program, these risk assessments that help us build our plan. Also allows time for advisory services where we participate in enterprise wide projects or committees and allows for any management request. So to give you a little bit more detail about the employer audits and the internal audits, I'll hand that over to Chris and Roseanne. Sorry about that. During the six-month audit plan, we will really be reviewing the same areas that we reviewed in the, in the last risk assessment as they're still high risk. So we're going to be looking at special compensation, base compensation, and sick leave. And during that audit plan, we're, we're anticipating looking at about between 50 and 70 audits over that time. Um, and as I mentioned previously, we started out the year looking or to, at 200 audits in the last audit plan after we subtracted what was completed and what was left in the audit plan uh, as we subtracted out what we, what we previously completed and then what was left in the audit plan and we added in all of, all of the Crow audits, you'll see the list that we have here. And it consists of about 125 employers. However, we're not gonna be auditing all 125 of those employers because the audit plan does complete 50, we're gonna be completing 50 to 70 audits. However, it does identify any employers that could potentially be audited during that time. Here we illustrate how the six-month plan provides coverage and supports the organizational goals. Across the top row, you'll see the proposed audits, which addresses the enterprise risks on the left column and aligns with the strategic plan goals in the color coding. And I forgot to mention, the full plan is in your attachment. So before we go on and um, request your approval, we want to just give you a brief update since we drafted the agenda item three on our audit plan progress for 2023. I was going to have Chris give a brief update and Roseanne. So, so in the 2023 audit plan, we our goal was to complete 90 to 110 audits, which we anticipated being challenging with the implementation of AB 1667. We got a little late on a little bit of a late start getting that plan going. But as of October 5th, we have issued 85 final reports um, as, as identified in the, agenda, in the agenda docs. And then in the month of October, we have also issued an additional 12 final reports, which brings our total up as of today up to 97 final reports that have been issued. Um, and as such, we are, we're extremely confident we are going to either meet or exceed the top end of our goal, which would be 110 audits by the end of the year. And for internal audits, we continue to make significant progress. We are on schedule to complete the, uh, the plan, and we will present our results to the March uh, 2024 ARM Committee. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris, I'll start with you. So 85 is just great. Thanks for that. Um, although the team did it. So yes. if you could pass along my thanks to the team. Um, I'd appreciate that. Do you, uh, Chris, you think, so you say 50 to 70, you think 70 is realistic? Or should I be thinking 50? 
Um, I think 70 is realistic. I would think of the upper end of that range is definitely realistic. We have a pretty good pipeline going right now of audits that are started. Um, one of the things that did come out of AB 1667 is we have that six or two month gap in how long employers to have to provide responses. Exactly. So we can forecast a little bit during that time of what's coming. So I would think we would be in the upper end of that 50 to 70. I just wouldn't, we don't know what's going to come out of some of those. So we didn't want to commit quite to that level yet. Right. All right. Um, and then Roseanne, so um, tell me about the pension solution audit um, in terms of, of timing and uh, do you, you feel it's ready? You feel it's ready to be audited? I'm sorry to ask a hard question like that. I'm sorry, but it's my job. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have um, had conversations with um, Anthony um, Sweeney, the director of the Pension Solution, and um, he, he uh, informs us that it, the data migration piece is mature and has been performed and is ready for audit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then what... what after the data migration, which makes sense to be the first part, right? Mm -hmm. What, um, if, <laughs> reading tea leaves, as was said earlier, um, what do you think the next audit might take a look at, and when do you think that might show up on the plan? Um, I think the next one would probably be project management, um, and that would be proposed in the 24-25 um, fiscal year audit plan. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. One is logistical and one is related to pension solutions. So thank you for asking that ahead of me. Um, so there is a, a, a contract on the consent agenda for Clifton, um, Larson, Allen, LLP. Do I understand that correctly, that this audit plan is in conjunction with that vendor that it, this is created? Because I didn't hear you guys say that. It sounded like this was an internal audit um, audit plan that was developed, but then I see the, the contract. So I just want to see the nexus between the two. Are they the same or no? Thanks. Now I get it. I was like, what is she talking about? Okay. Um, so Clifton Larson LLP does do some, we do outsource some of our work when it has to do with technology, information okay. security. So yes. Between yes. What so, you guys were saying versus what the contract is for. Right. So okay. they'll be working on the information security audit. Perfect. Okay, and then back to pension solutions. So I actually, when I read that, I started as well. Um, so a couple questions. Is the the idea that it is an interim audit of pension solution? And the reason I ask that is because obviously pension solution is not completed. So that's the first part. Is it an interim or is it a, a final audit of this particular piece? And then if you should have findings, how does that impact the overall uh, progress of the system um, that is still working its way to completion. So I, so the timing of it kind of seems strange to me a little bit, but, but maybe there's the, it'll be useful. I'm sure it'll be useful, but then how is that useful? And does that impact or impede our pension solution going forward? And that makes me a little nervous. So if you can expand on that, that would be helpful. Excellent question. Um, it is interim. This is definitely not the final audit of the pension solution project. What is the data right Piece. So it yes. seemed like you were going to do segments of the pension solution, and so sometimes you know you will do an interim audit for a certain scope of period or you know a length of time, and then have results related to that. So that's where that came from. Yeah. So um, it, <laughs> I would think that the results of this pension solution data migration will be valuable, and um, we will definitely share it with the pension solution team and then um, see where, if there are any, you know, uh, management actions to be taken there. Um, and then um, we will be able to also perform another audit. And um, we have had some conversations about um, performing an audit prior to the implementation of the pension solution. So does that because an audit takes a lot of time. We mm -hmm. heard, heard about that during the financial statement audit. And so auditors going in and asking questions and asking for data and asking for interviews, is that going to delay us moving forward with Pension Solution as well? Um, we, and I know Pension Solution yeah. is in the next yeah, right. item, but I, it just it seems like there's a crossover there, and I just want to make sure that we're, mm -hmm. we're good. 
Yeah. So one of the things we're rarely conscious of, especially when they're big projects, is that when we're doing an audit that we're coordinating and we're ensuring that we're not impeding a process. So that's and when it's a vendor, and in this case, it's probably going to be a third party. We always discuss that, and and we make sure that you know this information should be readily available so that we can do the testing. But um, we provide them what we can, so we're having less interruptions, so the project can continue to move forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I do not see any further questions. Dr. Yetman, do you have any further questions? Okay. Um, are there any statements from the public? There are no members in the public in queue. Go ahead. And then you'll be actioning. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is an action item to approve the six month audit plan. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all very much for all your work. It's, uh, you've definitely been busy, and we appreciate that. <laughs> and we will see you in a couple months. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That brings us to the review of information requests. I don't believe we had any. Yeah, I did not hear any information requests. Okay. Um, is there anything that we need to talk about on the draft agenda. There um, maybe one change on there where we will move up the committee education at the beginning of the day and before we move on to the information item, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Okay. Okay, great. Are there any um, final statements from the public? There are no members in the public in queue. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that concludes our audits and risk management meeting for today. Um, the full board is scheduled to start in closed session. I told everybody 10.30, they didn't believe me, so <laughs> we'll see who's here and when we start. It says 11, right? So right. probably so we'll we be out at 11.30? We, well, we're gonna do a closed session and then go into lunch, so we could oh. probably be back for open session as early as 12.30. We have it scheduled at 12.45, but let's kind of have a 15 minute buffer, so that will be the target, does that sound? So good? we plan to start at 12.30. An Ish. open session. Okay. Yes. Open session. We're shooting for 1230. Thank you, everyone.